can I introduce Michelle Castles to you? Well, she doesn't really need any introduction because many of you already know about her or have worked with her before. She's actually demonstrated to KSA as well. She is online today to talk to us. Well, the, uh, the title, if you like, of her presentation is Beyond the Studio, Art Psychotherapy. Uh, I believe, Michelle, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you're doing a master's in that subject at the moment. Yes, that's right. Yes, I'm doing a master's at Edinburgh at the minute. And uh, so I'm going to, but I've only just started, so I'll, I'll only be able to say a bit about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay, well, thank you very much. Ted for that introduction and um, so yes I'm going to talk to you today about uh, about my a little bit about where I've started where I've come from but also then going beyond that into what I'm doing at the minute as well and uh, so I'm going to share my screen here and uh, here you go can everybody see can see that on the screen just put give me a thumbs up if you can see and hear everything that's going on great that's great okay um, yeah, so, um, so unfortunately I am only able to talk with you today and show you some images because um, I know that some of you have, have been to past demonstrations that I've given um, where, where you've seen how I've shaped and formed the wire um, and uh, so you'll know a bit about that. And when I was looking back over the YouTube video from the last demonstration actually, last week, I noted something interesting that whilst I was demonstrating to you, I was able to talk with you at the same time. So. In fact, that's quite an amazing thing when we think about it because we can be fully engaged in art making and fully attentive to speaking as well. But the sculptures that I make, and because I've made them for like a quarter of a century, um, they're made with skills I've learned so well that the making process flows freely from my unconscious mind, which enables my conscious functioning to formulate conversation at the same time. And that's probably something to do with the left side and the right side of the brain having different roles and not being in competition with each other and therefore able to function at the same time. And maybe you're wondering why I'm bringing this up and where it's all going. Well, today, as well as talking to you about the sculptures, um, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to art psychotherapy. And um, that's because, as Ted said, I'm, I'm studying for a master's degree at the minute from Queen Margaret University in Edinburgh. But, um, but first of all, we're going to take a quick look at, uh, at where I began all those years ago. And here, this, is my, this was my first studio, which was a, a room on the fourth story of a disused warehouse um, on the roof um, in, in Newcastle, city centre, where the only sign of life from my window were pigeons, because I could just see across a multi-storey car park. And the saucepan on the floor... Uh, was actually my mould for shaping my sculptures um, because in those days that's, that's all I had and I hadn't yet invented the log which actually I think you can probably see behind me the logs which I use now which you'll have seen before as well so that's all I had was a saucepan and a plastic chair and a radio and that was about the, the sum total of my worldly possessions and I was there for about six weeks um, before I turned up to find the bailiffs at the front door one day because the landlord had been illegally subletting the building to artists who were just glad of having a space and, and didn't bother asking for contracts. So they said I had an hour to clear, clear all my stuff out, uh, but it didn't take as long as that. <laughs> um, but that's okay, because the most important asset for any artist, as you'll know, comes from the inside, and that can be transported to any space and accessed at any time. So my subject um, was and has always been and will always be people. Um, these are uh, some of the life drawings that I've done. And, uh, and the medium that I choose to express the subject is wire mesh. And I, I fell in love with the material straight away, despite its prickly ways. It's been a labour of love to domesticate this tough, uh, material which resists uh, any rounded form and cuts and scratches like a wild thing. Why on earth would I have wanted to carry on using it and for 25 years? Well, I guess I just like the results and the challenge. It's lightweight, it's beautifully reflective and it's transparent and it's delicate and strong. It's versatile and best of all, it's the embodiment of everything I was trying to express and the embodiment of whatever meaning the viewer 
had also projected into it. Depending on where you're standing depends on where you see. As a man is, so he sees. But I'll come back to that later. And so I set out on a quest to master the mesh and the human form. Fortunately, I haven't quite managed either of those tasks yet, which, uh, which gives me the, d the desire to continue working and striving, because how boring would our lives as artists be if we reached our goals before our life's end? So I've had similar sort of experiences on my journey that I know a lot of you will have also had. I've had highs and lows. My first high was being selected for the New Contemporaries show in 1998 in London, and that was as a result of my degree show for the university. He's a, a very much younger self. <laughs> um, I was only one of two sculptors graduating in the country that year in the, uh, asked to do the exhibition. And so I made my way to the bright lights of Big City um, with a pair of sculptures that I named Adam and Eve. And there they are there. So uh, I'm going to show you some images of the pieces I've made over the years while I, I talk over some of these experiences. So from there on, I worked hard to try and exhibit my work as much as possible. Um, I managed to get a gallery in Chelsea to take me on as a regular exhibitor and act as agents to promote my work as well and for a percentage of sales. And that sounds, sounds like it was all going so well, but it's never as cut and dry as that. And uh, being young and naive, I found myself working crazy hours, sending a lot of work down to London um, and not, not getting paid for it and never seeing it again either. It wasn't until my, my cousin told me that she'd been visiting London and I'd seen my work in Harvey Nichols, um, and, uh, of which I knew nothing about, um, that woke me up to the fact that I was being exploited. Um, in those days though, without the internet and website in so many ways for us to stay in touch, it was really difficult for artists to get reputable agencies. So at least nowadays, we've got to some extent a bit more autonomy with the internet and we're better able to promote ourselves and have direct, um, direct contact with clients, which you weren't allowed to have in those days. Um, but the first few years after qualifying were really, really difficult. And somebody had once said to me, decide what you want to do with your life and then work out how you're going to pay for it. So I'd set my sights on being an artist and would have to pay for it through menial work, I realised at first. And it meant going against the grain going against the expectations of family and friends. Um, but I knew that if I joined the rat race and looked for a good job, um, that I would never bother picking up my tools again. And, and I also knew that I had to give my best time to my art. And that meant working during the day in the studio and then, um, and then find a job in the evenings. And invariably that, that meant menial work. So I found employment in a Chinese takeaway working for evenings and uh, that funded my, my studio rent and the cost of materials. Um, in fact, I was happy doing that. Um, but the hardest struggle was just not meeting the expectations of the people around me and being told that what I was doing was an expensive hobby and that I, I'd played for long enough now and had to get a proper job. Um, but in retrospect, I'm glad I didn't cave into the pressure to conform because eventually I did start to get a few paid commissions uh, and slowly and surely I gained a reputation for specialising in, in the wire sculptures of the human form. Uh, and then I found a decent agent and an experienced mentor um, who guided me towards being more discerning about where I exhibited and helped me raise my status. So I work to commission mostly these days um, and I only exhibit occasionally because you'll probably, already, you'll probably all know that exhibitions take a huge amount of time and planning um, and are for the most part advertisements, which are necessary, but can be expensive too. Um, but I have been able to get private and public commissions over the years, and, and this has inspired me and kept, and kept me going and kept me motivated to get into my studio every day and do my best. So... Um, not being able to be there in person and do a demonstration, I'm going to show you some of the ways, some of the ways that I work. 
So and I'm going to talk about just a few of the commissions quickly um, and how I've approached them. So the way I, I need to approach a commission, especially if I don't get to meet the client until, until installation, is, um, is that I would send them a video of, of some sketches rather than just sending the pictures over the internet. I would, I would, uh, I would do this so that they get to, to see me, to see my face, to see where I work, and that um, gives them the confidence to know that I work professionally. So I'll just show you, this is a quick video that I made for a client who wanted some capoeira figures. Now capoeira is a, it's a Brazilian martial art stroke dance. So it's, um, it's sort of a, it's a mixture of the two and uh, it's, a, it's fantastic actually and it's, it's taught now in exercise classes. And so this, this person was an enthusiast of capoeira and asked me to do um, some figures for their, for their wall. And, uh, and so the first process, the first stage of any, of any sculpture is the drawing. And this shows you how I go from drawing um, and then the final piece itself. So here we go, here's the video. Hopefully it should, should work. There we go. Okay, so there you can you, you saw that um, that uh, capoeira video, and, you, and uh, that shows you a little bit about my method. Um, then I'll show you quickly another commission that I did, which was um, called the the conductor, and uh, and then this this is the next stage of a design where so once I finish the drawings, I then go on to making a maquette of the piece. Um, this was a commission that I made for Sedba School and it was commissioned by the widow of one of the past pupils who was a music scholar. Um, and several years ago, I went to a concert to hear the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra. And where I was sitting in the audience, I was directly behind the conductor. And the musicians were amazing, of course, but the conductor absolutely fascinated me. He was fantastic. He had so much energy, so much enthusiasm, and he held the entire ensemble together and uh, the stage was like an electric circuit where the energy went from him into the musicians and back into him again. And so as I left the concert that evening, um, I was determined that one day I would, I would make a musical conductor. And so I was absolutely delighted when this opportunity eventually came up. Um, so here we go. So as usual, I'm back at the, the drawing board and I, um, I, I start with drawings. There we go. So I start with the drawings initially, and then the next stage is making the maquette. And here I'll show you how, how I did that, how I do that. Thank you. 
Uh, there we go. So, um, so this, these were these tiny models were just an eighth of life size, but it's just enough to show the client um, the type of poses that I have in mind. Um, and as, as I, when I finished this on a whim, I sprayed it with gold paint and, uh, and I kind of did it without thinking really because the client then said that they were happy with the pose. Oh, and by the way, they really liked the gold effect as well. And so could they have that as a finish? And that, that pose, this posed a big problem for me because um, I couldn't possibly then just take a, a can of spray paint to a finished sculpture and hope that it would look professional um, and authentic and stand the test of time. So, uh, so I realized after some research that I would need to use real gold leaf to achieve an authentic, um, authentic piece of sculpture and, and pay fitting tribute to the role of the conductor. So um, briefly, this is what I had to do. I had to make the entire figure. I, this, is, this is what I did. I made the, the entire figure and I tacked it to the get together just barely enough so that he would stay together. And that was just to make sure that he looked okay and that the proportions were right. So literally this figure, if I was to breathe on it, it would have fallen over. So I just captured it. And then I took him all apart and I gold leafed every single section of the body. And the reason I had to do this was that because I needed access to the inside of the body to brush the gold, the excess gold leaf off, and I needed to get it to do it tidily. So then, uh, and then I swept up all the gold carefully. I really enjoyed doing it, by the way. It transformed the steel. It was just amazing. Um, so I swept up the gold, and then when I reassembled the figure, I was able to use those bits and pieces to go around the seams, so it wasn't wasted. And I also gave him hair, which I wouldn't normally do, and that's a, this, is a, this was a, a new thing for a sculpture, but actually it, it really changed the way the sculpture looked as well. So I gave him a kind of Simon Rattle haircut there um, because I find that a lot of conductors have similar kind of hairstyles where it just has to be kind of long enough to, to dance to the music maybe. And then for another experimental idea, um, I really wanted to express the the flow of energy that came from the conductor. So I imagined it was like molten metal um, coming through his body and, and, and spreading into the orchestra and touching and, and making this circuit. So I used resin to pour liberally down his legs. And this was a real risk to take because I had really very little control over where it would flow. Um, and having already made and gold leafed the entire sculpture, there was no going back. Um, and I don't, I, I, mean, I normally have quite a controlled approach to making sculptures. I always use tape measures and calculators. And so this process felt really alien to me. Um, and it's probably the most creative thing <laughs> that I've ever done. And um, probably the, the, the only real artistry that I've ever really employed. So, uh, so here's the finished piece anyway. And then the last commission I'm going to talk to you about is a commission that I'm I'm working on at the moment, um, which I've been working on for the last two years, actually. It's for Winchester Council, who are building a sport and leisure park. And, um, and within that park is a, uh, is a hydrotherapy suite with an inner courtyard. And the swimming pool here that you can see will just be used for uh, the less, uh, less able-bodied. So um, uh, I've actually just finished the sculptures for the courtyard, but I, I can't show you them yet because um, because the client hasn't seen them. So, uh, but they're, they're to go in here anyway. And so what I've done um, is I've made a sequence of figures and you'll probably know that I often make sequences of figures just to show movement and dynamism. Um, and I've attempted in this instance to mirror the experience of the users of the pool um, to highlight the healing power of water. So the sculptures are not um, showing off sporting prowess like a lot of my other work does, but they do embody um, acquired power and achievement on a different scale. So, um, so here's a, a drawing. This is the first of the series in that. Uh, it's a series of three sculptures and they're, they're slightly larger than life size. So this is the first one. Um, and he's curled up and looking inwards and he's, he's weighted down by gravity and he's feeling restricted. The second figure in response to emerging into the water is slowly beginning to uncurl. 
Um, and then the final sculpture is kind of being held and supported by the water. His limbs are unencumbered and unrestricted and free. Um, and so I'm going to show you a, a, a short video of how I, um, uh, when I left the stage and when I then made the maquettes for the large sculpture. So you can see, and it's a bit, it's a bit more tricky when I'm making sculptures for um, public places because they, the council really have to know exactly what, they want to know exactly what it's going to look like before it's in there. And that's, that's quite difficult to do because even though I have a vision in my mind and I know what it's going to look like, they have to know before they'll commission anything so that it's going to be safe and, and all the rest of it meet requirements. So I, what it means is I have to make an, a scale model of the building or the space that it's going into and then make, make the models so that they, they virtually go into that space. It's really quite an involved process. So anyway, this shows you how I, how I got to that. <laughs> Somebody's not muted. Could you please mute so we can hear me talking? Mm -hmm. just joined us I think a few people I allowed a few people into the room there um, could you just put yourselves on to mute um, so that we can't hear any background noises if you could just mute yourselves anyone who's just just come in thank you um, and so uh, yes yeah, so this piece the piece I've just shown you will be will be installed next month and uh, actually I do have a sneak preview of the um, of some of the the net, or some of the figures, yeah. So just this part, part of the figures. This is part of the finished work here. So there you go. You're the first to see that. Um, so if I just stop sharing for a minute and talk to you about the next thing. So like, like the, uh, like the pictures in the book. Um, I've always tried to make my work part of a story, part of a narrative. 
And I imagine the sculptures as, as kind of three-dimensional illustrations to somebody's story. And to, to draw or paint or sculpt a story is to take the unconscious and present it then in a visual form. And we can give embodiment to our experiences and thoughts in this way, not only to be able to see them more clearly ourselves, but also to allow others to understand us better as well. So a couple of years ago, I became interested in art as a therapy. And then uh, I got lucky enough to work for a few hours every week with, um, with adults experiencing mental health problems. And uh, I facilitated an art class and I was absolutely overwhelmed by the positive change um, that people experienced as a result of being creative. Um, and so when I was helped to ask to help out initially, it was because there were 15 adults in the class and the lead artist um, was, was finding it impossible to give the time and attention needed to every individual. And they'd begun a programme of lessons to learn how to do screen printing. Uh, and when I arrived partway into the project, they were all at hugely varying stages of their pieces of work, as well as varying stages of enthusiasm, I noted which is unsurprising because screen printing is quite a tricky process and I even had problems myself trying to help. So one sunny day as people arrived for the class, um, it was decided that they would go out, outside and do some drawing instead of the usual lesson of screen printing. And this caused a bit of upset for a few people who didn't like to be surprised or to have a break from the routine. However, we managed to get everyone outside and once they began to draw the subjects of their choice, I noticed that they began to relax into the work really easily. And they also took varying approaches. Some were drawing with charcoal, pencil, some painted, some were picking up the natural materials and assembling them, basically making sculptures. And for the first time, myself and the other teacher weren't rushing from person to person trying to help them as well. So shortly afterwards, um, the, the, the lead facilitator moved on and then I took on that role and I immediately abandoned any idea of the class working on the same project um, because we live in a world of comparisons and if the person next to you is making the same thing it's only natural to compare uh, and I figured that these people had been compared all their lives and fallen short so instead I brought in a range of basic materials for them to use paints scrap paper, bottle tops, scraps of fabric, leftover bits of wire mesh, of course, <laughs> um, and all important, um, lots of books about artists with images that would inspire them, inspire their imaginations. And the response varied from some people eagerly getting on with something to others who did need a little bit more support and direction. And I set up a still life of objects, of bottles actually, um, as well, and I found this provided a more meditative exercise for those who wanted to escape decision-making and just enjoy the process of recording what they could see. So it was a bit tricky for me because I had 15 very different people doing very different projects and I had to remember what they were doing every week so that they had everything that they needed. But the way they worked fascinated me. Some people would begin pieces which they would then build on for months and other people would make something completely new and unrelated every single week. One person spoke to no one and would only work with their own black biro in their own sketch pad. And that's, this didn't change throughout the entire time there. But one week he brought in biscuits for everyone to share and I thought that spoke volumes. So not having any real understanding of the issues that I was facing, I often felt at a bit of a loss. Um, as for what to do when, for example, one of the students consistently made really competent drawings every week and then would tear them up and put them in the bin after each session. Uh, but the important thing was that they worked at their own pace on their own unique pieces of art and also that they turned up for the sessions, which was an achievement in itself because I knew that for a lot of people, it was the only time they ever left the house in, in, the, in the whole week was for those art lessons sessions. So a few months later I was offered the community space in Tully House Museum to put on an exhibition of the students work and so this was a I knew that this was a great opportunity for them but and a privilege but I had misgivings as well about it because I was aware 
that there were massive anxiety issues at stake and social problems. And I worried that the pressure of making work for an exhibition, which was going to be seen by the public, would put a lot of people off. But at the same time, I was under pressure to prove the worth of the project, which only received funding uh, based on evidence of progress, which in itself had an evaluative scale. And I knew for sure that, um, I knew for sure that the, that the classes were having a really positive effect on everybody, but trying to find solid, indisputable evidence for that um, was really difficult, you know, because it's a transpersonal approach. Um, and by its very nature, if we try to pin it down to find evidence, then we destroy that which is transpersonal in the first place. Anyway, the bottom line was that an exhibition of work was unnegotiable. So I set about approaching the group with the idea. There was a mixed response, but I was pleased to see them at least discussing it amongst themselves. And this meant that they saw it as a group effort and that they'd gotten to know each other and, and they felt part of the community. Anyway, six months later, we put together an amazing exhibition in Tully House uh, and we decided on the theme of recycling, mostly because all the materials we used were, were borrowed or second hand. <laughs> and in the end, uh, 12 people decided to exhibit, which involved uh, an enormous amount of surmounting of personal fears. So here is a, a three minute video of the work which went into the exhibition. And, uh, and just to mention that everybody in the film gave me permission to, to film them. And it, it was actually played in a loop alongside the exhibition as well. And those people who didn't want to be in the film are obviously not in it. So, um, so I can show you this now. There we go. So, um, 
so yeah so that's actually that exhibition is still on in Tully House because about a month just before we were meant to take it down we went into lockdown last year and everything was closed so it remains locked inside Tully House <laughs> and I don't know I don't know when we'll get access in to, to take it down but anyway um working with that project really inspired me to, to find out more about um, art as therapy and so, so yes yeah, so now I'm a first year student at uh, Queen Margaret University in Edinburgh and I'm really enjoying the course so um, we're going to find out a bit more about about this so what is art therapy and um, so the, there are two issues to mention first art as a therapeutic exercise and art as therapy so you all understand the therapeutic benefits of being creative, the wonderful feeling of mark making, creating something from nothing and getting lost in the process and the ability of art to lift us out of our everyday lives, our struggles, our worries, and to make us agents with some small control over the outcome, whether just in being free to choose a colour or direct the line or delight in the products that we've enjoyed making. But what about art as a language? What is art psychotherapy? Um, so you don't have to be an artist to, uh, to benefit from art therapy. In fact, in some ways, it's best not to have the technical skills or talent, because often this can get in the way of image making. Um, for example, the client will be putting effort into making it look good or getting it right rather than simply drawing their experience. Um, and it isn't even necessary to draw their life experiences. It's enough just to make marks on the paper and allow the medium to, to guide your hands, as it were. Um, Freud talked about free expression being the optimum goal of, of a talking therapy, where clients would um, allow their words to flow uncensored. But this is also true of art therapy, where somebody creates without running the process through their conscious mind first. Um, and by using colors and lines and shapes and symbols and textures, you can tap into the more imaginative side of you in order to more effectively um, solve problems and gain perspective. And the images that you think you just happen to choose or create are often your right brain's way of communicating information to you, um, much like a dream, so as clients create art, they might, um, they might analyze uh, what they've made and how it makes them feel. And, uh, and through exploring it, they can look for themes and conflicts that might be affecting their thoughts and emotions and behaviors. And, and then patterns can begin to emerge within the client's life um, in, in, in front of them and the, and the therapist. So the ability of images to prompt a range of thoughts and feelings without having to tie these down explicitly is a key resource of art therapy. Um, and in a way, the medium, the paper, the art materials become the third thing in the room along with the therapist and the client. And it forms a kind of triangular relationship which takes the focus away from the directness of a talking therapy um, where the client might feel under the, under the spotlight and could cause then the information to be censored or, or kept back. So interacting with art materials provides like a buffer in the room that can enable people to be together um, and, and to feel together comfortably together in the room when they might not have managed it otherwise. Um, my next slide shows um, in an instance, more or less what it's taken me the last couple of minutes to explain. And uh, here is an example of, um, of the immediate effect of images and the inadequacy of words in a lot of instances. So there you go, there's a, a man with, a, with a confused confusion in his mind. He, draws, he starts to draw, he gets it down onto paper. It, it's still confused, but it, at least it's in front of him and it's, it's out there in the open and he's feeling better for it. Um, so our understanding of the evidence um, is, that, uh, is that most people given a diagnosis of a mental illness do not have something wrong with their brains. And their brains have just been, well, our brains have been shaped by evolution to respond in certain ways. So we don't see it as something you've got, like a cold or an infection. And many people 
who receive a psychosis-related diagnosis have experienced psychological trauma or prolonged stress. So art making offers a safe way of expression. Um, the paper with its sides and edges become like a container for their feelings. Um, and, and then the artwork produced then by clients is treated in the same confidential way that any conversation would also be. So it's kept by the therapist in a locked drawer until the end of the, until the end of all of the therapy after which it's disposed of unless, unless the client wants it. Um, children respond quickly to art therapy and creative therapeutic play and creating pictures helps them to express emotions that sometimes they just can't verbalize or name or identify and it's a safe way of them sharing their stories. Actually, this just quickly, this, um, these paintings were produced by a 10 year old boy. The first one that he produces on the, the left hand side at the bottom against the blue background and it's a, it, is it's a, a castle with a, a fortress and it's uh, looking quite scary and, uh, and it's got quite a foreboding thunderous sky above it. This boy had just been taken into care. Um, both of his, his parents had divorced. He was the only child of that, um, of that family. And then they subsequently went on to remarry and have an, had another family. And so he was spending six months at a time with each parent and it wasn't working for him. It didn't work for him. So um, he, he had a breakdown. He was eventually taken into care. And these were the pictures that he produced whilst in having art therapy. So that was the first picture of the castle, which is really, is kind of very symbolic of obviously of the way he was feeling. The next picture he did was against the white background and, um, and he's taken the windows like out. So he just didn't want anybody to see inside of himself. He had actually um, written his name across the top and then blackened it out with this kind of foreboding rainbow over the top of it. As time went on, he just kept drawing castles all the time. As time went on, this next castle, um, which is in color then, has a drawbridge, as you can see, and this is suddenly is a, is a point of contact to the, to the therapist and he's reaching out to the world and he started to open up. I don't have any more drawings from that, but the, the, the subsequent castles that he made started to have people around them and communities and they were a lot more lively and um, yeah, he, his, he started to, to improve and to talk. So this, that's, that's the, the, how art therapy works. Um, there's an increasing body of evidence to support, um, to support these therapies. And experiments in neuroscience have recently identified links between art imagery and emotional um, and cognitive function. Because due to the, the brain's plasticity, changes can go in both directions. So the brain can adapt into and out of disturbed states. Because it's worth noting that changes in our brain occur all the time. Um, in the general population, just in response to our lives every day. Um, for example, changes occur in children who have been abused or neglected. Um, and then another study has shown that just a 10 session art class in a museum was followed by beneficial changes in the brains of older people. Anyway, there's so much to learn about this and I'm, I'm having a fascinating time doing it. Um, so as I said, I'm a first year student and so I've still got another year and a half of studying as well as 480 hours of work experience before I qualify. So I've got a lot, um, a long way to go and a lot to learn. So I'd like to finish with the quote that I began with from William Blake, who said, as a man is, so he sees. There we go. So uh, thank you for listening. If you want to unmute yourselves, you'd be welcome to ask me any questions if you like, and I'll see if I can answer them. But thanks for listening anyway. Michelle, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Uh, right. Um, a question from me, Michelle. Mm -hmm. um, the root of the word psychotherapy is from the Greek, I believe. Um, psyche meaning mind, and therapeia, which means healing. Uh. So a psychotherapist mm -hmm. is therefore a mind healer. Would you consider yourself to be a mind healer? Or maybe would you consider yourself to be 
a facilitator? <laughs> yeah, that's, um, that's a really good question. I'm glad you brought that up, Ted, actually, because, uh, you know, I think it's really important not to see yourself as some kind of saviour that goes in and cures people because it just it doesn't it doesn't work like that and it, or, it immediately creates a gulf between you and the client in fact um the the, the least intervention you can do is actually the best is, is to be as you know just to be alongside somebody because all people really want is is to uh, to have their is to be validated and to be understood so all you're doing is giving them the space to do, to do that um, and to be creative and just be with them on that journey and you know perhaps helping them with with the tools they need to heal themselves because actually that's that's what will happen as um transformation in anybody is is underpinned by uh, creative thinking uh, by being creative and by critical thinking and um and those two things together well, uh, it, it will lead to transformation. So, yeah, it's not the therapist who does that. They simply accompany um, the client on their journey. Okay, thanks, Michelle. Lynn? Can I ask a question? How come your hands aren't cut to ribbons? Because <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that wire, and it's, it's terribly hard to manipulate. I saw that you had pincers and tools, mm. but when you cut it, you're going to have all those sharp little bits. How Do you wear thick gloves? No. No, I mean, I, I get asked that question a lot, actually. Uh, no, I don't. And, I, yeah, I do cut my hands sometimes. Um, I hardly really notice it until I uh, until I wash them or until I use um, those those awful hand gels that we've all got to use all the time now. <laughs> so the last thing you really want is an alcohol rub on your fingers when they're covered in cuts. <laughs> um, so it does happen sometimes, but I, I never really get any bad bad cuts. They're just superficial and they they yeah. kind of go away and I can see how that would put off a lot of people from using that material because it, it can be a bit sharp. But I find that if I work too quickly, then that's when that I, I start to get scratched. But if I'm in the moment and I'm paying attention and I work slowly, then normally it's okay. Fascinating. Do you have a, a YouTube where, cause I'd love to have a go. Mm. Is there a YouTube or something where you can take people through the basics <laughs> um no i i mean i don't i don't have anything like that i think you know like anything um the knowing is in the doing so if you were just to if you were just to get yourself a piece of mesh which you can get from any diy store yeah. or from amazon or anything like that just buy a small piece um and uh you know just start bending and playing with it there, there are actually lots of artists using mesh now when i first started there weren't really very many at all it was quite unique but now there are lots of people using it. So, um, yeah, and everybody uses it in a different way. So it's, it's about finding the way that suits, suits you. I would start off with maybe aluminium mesh or something really quite soft. Um, and, uh, you know, because sometimes the, the, I use stainless steel mesh, which is really, really hard. Uh, but I have to use that if it's going outside, you know, or going to a swimming pool or something like that. So, um, but yeah, start off with something a bit softer. And then it's actually a beautiful material to work with and it's nice and clean. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, can I? Um, do you, thank you, Michelle, for that. Do you do your own um, installation of your work? Or do you get someone to help you? <laughs> it, it looks amazing. Um, thank you. Well, it depends on um, it depends on how high how high up it's got to be. About, so when I was about forty, I, uh, I I did an installation which was in a leisure centre, and it was it was way up high. It was about ten metres off the ground, and I, I hired some scaffolding, and uh, I hadn't put it together properly. Oh God! <laughs> and it was really really shaky. And by the time I got to the top of the scaffolding, I felt so sick and dizzy. Uh, anyway, I managed to put up the, the entire installation and I vowed I would never, ever do that again, that I would always, <laughs> I'd always cost it into the project that, that they would hire a proper cherry picking machine mm. and somebody else to do it. <laughs> so, so no, I generally don't do um, any, anything like that now unless it's very easy. So. <laughs> oh, <excellent. laughs> 
You say when you were 40, uh, you mm. don't look 40 yet. You look about 25. Oh, you know? <laughs> Working in metal is really good for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's very kind of you to say. But um, mm. actually, it does take its toll on, on my wrists. And uh, after I've been working uh, for a number of hours, I do get, I get a bit of pain. And, uh, and that was one of the reasons as well why I thought it would be a good idea to investigate other channels in you know in art that I could um, that I could uh, do you know so which is why I thought that art therapy would be uh, quite a good uh, quite a good thing and, and my my plan is that I will mix when I when I qualify I'll be able to mix doing a bit of therapy and doing my own art as well at the same time and mm. um, so yeah no oh, it's brilliant thank you so much the gold conductor was just oh oh I know <laughs> that one Thank just you. wonder, Michelle, how mm. how you transport these from your studio to wherever they're going. It fascinates well, you know, because packing packing a, a a picture is bad enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, do you know what? They're so lightweight, and amazingly, I, I can get I can get about three life size figures into my car. Oh, no. uh, yeah, I know it's amazing, and sometimes onto the roof as well, and uh, I, I get a few funny looks. <laughs> When I when I drive down the motorway with, the, <laughs> with these insignias on my car, but um, yes, uh, or sometimes I just hire a van. But because they're light, actually, they're they're easy to transport. Yeah. So yeah, not too bad. <laughs> Take them on the on the train and have a seat for each one. <laughs> <laughs> Book a carriage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you exhibited abroad at all? Uh, no, I haven't. Um, I haven't actually. Not not yet. Not yet. I haven't. I think it, it's the transportation, the problem yes. of that, which would be difficult. Um, I don't really know how to uh, to do that. I had an opportunity to to do a commission in Mexico, in Mexico City, in a big hotel, um, and but the only it was quite a large piece, and the only way I could have done it was to go across and make it which it would have taken me about six months, but because my family were, were young at the time and I just, I can't just get up and go to another country for six months. So I couldn't do it, unfortunately, but the, that would be the, the solution would be to have an exhibition or to have anything abroad. The solution, the easiest is to go over there and just, and just to make it there actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can I just ask a question? Do, yeah. do you do small um commissions rather than all outdoor would you do one for indoors yeah yes i do a lot of a lot of that especially for private clients um yes yeah, some people just want a very small figure for inside the house yeah. and the smallest i can do is probably about um i'll show you it's probably about an eighth of life size so here we go so this little uh, figure here is a is a he's playing the saxophone oh and, yes uh, Oh, yeah. I don't know if you can see it properly, it's tiny. Yeah. Because uh, yeah. that's yeah. about an eighth of life size. But um, a lot of people ask for work, which is about a quarter of life size, so, so double that size. Yeah. And that's, um, and that's it's quite nice. Actually, my next commission, I'm working on something small. Somebody has sent me a, a, a bike, a very small bike, and wants a figure for this bike. Uh, so, uh, so that's uh, what I'm doing, actually. <laughs> <laughs> So yes, yeah, so well, thank you very much. Um, you. If there's no more questions, mm. should I just? Well, thank you. Thank yes, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>